me at Jello, Jello. You had me at Jello. You had me at Jello. Oh, you had me at Jello. Playing the Jello has so many pluses. It never grows old. Hi, everybody. Five o'clock on a Friday. Time for another episode of Cello Chat. Today, I'm delighted to have with me Dr. Sonia Kraus. How are you doing today, Dr. Kraus? I'm doing very well. Thank you. I'm a little cold. I'm in North Dakota instead of South Dakota, but I'm doing very well. <laughs> Excellent. Glad to hear it. All right. Would you start by telling the audience about yourself? How did you get to where you are today? So um, I am originally from Germany. I grew up in a small town outside of Frankfurt. And uh, I, my brother played the cello. I wanted to play an instrument. I actually started on fiddle. My parents built me a fiddle in a fiddle building class. Wow. And uh, when I was five years old, it's, it's a viola da gamba type of fiddle. So it is exactly like viola da gamba with frets. And with the bow hole that is um, below and not above. Um, and so I started that when I was five. And then I, when I was seven, I wanted to learn a real instrument. So uh, I started the cello because I loved the sound. Um, I tried out violin too, but it was just too high and too close to my ear. That's how I started with cello. Um, and then when it became time to decide what do I want to do with my life, I actually did not have this. Uh, straightforward decision of like, I have to be a musician. I had other interests. I was really interested in science and math as well as early childhood education, like preschool. But I decided I want to try to become a cellist. So I went to do my bachelor's um, in Stuttgart in Germany and then had the opportunity to study at Indiana University for my master's and my doctoral degree. And from then, another opportunity opened where I moved to Ecuador for a year to also teach and play in the orchestra as a principal cellist. And then I uh, I knew about the position that I currently have from when it was open before and kind of looked out for it, applied, and now I'm the cello professor at the University of South Dakota. Outstanding. <laughs> so on your website, which I like, uh, you have a very detailed uh, teaching philosophy, I think, which is great because there's a lot to, I mean, there's a lot to it. You, you talk about even the, the kind of the ways to play in a healthy manner, et cetera. I, it's, it's great. And among the things you touch on are the, in fact, I believe this is very early on, your priority in helping students to become their own teachers. If they're going to become their own teachers, one of the things they need to learn is to how to teach themselves to practice. So what, what's your approach to helping them learn to practice well and to practice as often as they ought to? So my teaching philosophy is that um, most things can be categorized. So um, if there's a hard passage, there will be another hard passage that has very similar technical issues. So instead of working on a specific passage, I'm teaching how to tackle passages that are that way so that when they come across something that is similar, they actually know how to fix the difficulties. So that's that's one thing. I, I, I'm categorizing things and I I give concepts. So I, I teach concepts on how to approach uh, certain styles. So we talk about musical styles uh, in different epochs and about the background of the composers so that when they play a piece later on by the same composer, they don't just know how to play that one piece that we did once in a lesson, but have an idea on how to approach the other pieces as well. So teaching those concepts makes them hopefully aware of everything that is possible and um, doing that in a technical way and then also in a musical way, hopefully after four years of doing a bachelor's, at least gives them a very good understanding of, of what's possible. There's always more to learn. 
And I personally say that after four years, you should move on to a different teacher because I have a certain teaching style and I have certain knowledge, but that doesn't mean that my teaching style is the only way and that I know everything. So I, I would like students to get a um, broad education and then send them on to other teachers um, and also invite a lot of teachers to do master classes with my students as well in order for them to get an idea what else is out there and do I is, is there just one way of, of learning and there definitely is not but that's kind of my approach to teaching all right is there anything in particular that you find that you have to do even for some students to help get them motivated to practice as often as um, as one needs to, especially if one's going to uh, pursue cello as a vocation? Well, um, I often say uh, life is all about having a purpose. And that goes for everybody, not just for musicians, but for everybody in life. I think we have this urge to find what is our place in society and how can we help make society a better place. So if you decide you want to become a musician, um, yeah, practicing is hard. And being by yourself and criticizing yourself constantly is really hard. However, um, just because something is hard doesn't mean it's not worth it. And I always say you don't have to be a musician. You don't have to be a cellist. You can choose literally whatever you want in life. If you think that that is your special talent, that is something that you can put out there and it will help others to have a better life. And if you think that you can do that with cello playing, either in teaching or in performing or in collaborating, then you have to put every ounce of your energy into making yourself as good as you can. So it's not about competition or beating somebody else or making a living because we can make a living in so many different ways. Yes, it's really hard in general for everybody, but uh, being a cellist, being a musician has another aspect. It, it should be our passion. It should be what we what we really put out there, our hearts, our souls, our connections. And so instead of trying to get to students to a certain level, I try to get them motivated about just being a good human being hmm. and finding a passion. So it's it's not it's not really just about cello playing at this point. All right. Now well, another thing I liked in your teaching philosophy, you uh, emphasize the importance of training the ear and of understanding music theory. So with the, the ear training component is probably related to the fact that you have presented uh, a few a number of times on, on intonation, uh, which is such an important thing for, you know, performers of any variable pitch instrument. And you, you have a concept that you use of security spots. So would you mind talking maybe broadly about the importance of ear training as you see it for, for cellists and then more specifically about the security spots? Yes, absolutely. I love talking about that. <laughs> Excellent. So, let me let me maybe start with the security spots and then go to the ear training aspect because it kind of influences each other. Great. So my concept of security spot practicing is that as human beings, we have spatial awareness. So um, if I look around in the room and I'm not in my home, I can look at things that are in my, my vision and I could close my eyes and just be like, okay, I know that here's my cup mm -hmm. and I didn't look at it. And it's not that I'm practicing, that, that I practiced this before. It's just spatial awareness. Mm -hmm. And when we practice intonation, um, oftentimes we rely just on, on feeling and on the ear. But we also have to recognize that our visual sense is actually one of the most dominant senses that we have because we use it all the time. So if we can visualize where certain spots are on the instrument, instead of having the whole fingerboard just be one black thing where the fingers have to go, then uh, we feel a little bit more of security. So what I do is I practice finding certain notes from, and there are two different versions, 
either you go from like the the part where the neck meets the cello and then find the spots in that distance so basically i put my my hand around um the neck of the instrument where where it goes into the body of the instrument and then for example one of my security spots is just the first finger first position so i practice that distance how does it feel so i'm less reliant on how high is my chair and do i have the same posture every day but my distance is reliant on the instrument itself. Mm-hmm. So I practice that spot with both fingers that could use that note. So first and second finger. Um, then the next security spot is where the fourth finger would go um, in first position. So it builds an octave to the lower string. The next, And I practice that with every finger. So first finger, second finger, third and fourth. The next security spot would be the spot where the first finger goes in fourth position. So building a unison with the upper string. And then the last one for the lower half would be the middle harmonic. And by finding those spots, like I always say, I have to be able to wake you up at three in the morning, give you a cello and you have to find that spot. That's how secure you should be. Um, All the positions are related, like they have at least one finger on one of those security spots. And so you're mapping out the fingerboard into different sections. And that gives you the security of like, I know where I'm at. And I'm not just like, I call it in in Germany, we call it being in the snow when we have no idea where we are. And we're just kind of finding our way and fighting through the fog. Um, There is, I know, I know people that either do it consciously or subconsciously, that same kind of training and they do it from the nut. So they put their hand on the nut and then measure everything according to the nut. For me, it just didn't work that well, but it's a personal preference. Um, I think that if you have something in the middle, you can go up and you can go down, you kind of in the center. If you go from the nut and you like go into the snow, uh, it's just so much further. Hmm. So the, that's kind of the, and I practice that with a tuner as well as with the open string and octave comparisons. And when I was younger, I practiced that at least 10 to 15 minutes a day. Um, then it w- was less and less the more I got secured. And even now, I practice it at least two, three times a week for five to 10 minutes to just keep keep that muscle memory alive. Now, the ear training factors in a little differently. Um, if you ever try to play like um, a sixth with an open string, so for, for example, first finger E on the D string, with a lower G string, and then you don't move the finger and you play that same E with the A string, mm-hmm. you will think you have the worst intonation that anybody could possibly have. So why is that? Well, because intervals are not, they're just not perfect. We have different types of intonation. Um, also playing with piano, like anybody who play, have, has played the A major sonata by Beethoven knows what I'm talking about. The beginning is different than when you have it in unison. So, um, Ear training is really important that you start hearing pitches in the key where they are written. So, and that can be trained in two different ways. Um, I always practice with a drone and I put the drone either on the tonic or on the dominant of the key that I'm currently in. So it's not that if a piece is in A major, it just always stays in A major. So there comes the theory, which key am I in, in a certain spot? And then I can put that drone on and tune every note to that drone because then I'm playing in tune in the key. So leading tones will be sharper and major thirds will be flatter, minor thirds will be sharper and all of that. And then I have this in tune intonation in a certain key that then works with string quartets and anything that that works with intonation. I hope that answers the question. I know it was long. (laughs) No, that's great. I think, again, probably any variable pitch instrument, we benefit from spending time thinking about what am I trying? What exactly is making this note sound in tune here, but not there? And the get our heads around the why of it. And so often the answer is in the music theory of it. Yeah. Yeah. And I have one more aspect that uh, I love to talk about because I, my new students, they always get the question, how many ways do you think there are to play out of tune? (laughs) And they're like, oh, millions. It's just like infinite. 
And I tell them, what if there are just two? Sharp <laughs> That's what they say. No. <laughs> what I mean is there are only two ways to technically play out of tune. The first is in a position. So if the handset is not good, like if the spacing of the fingers is not good, then you literally have to train every finger, every note all the time. So if you have a good hand set up that kind of puts all the fingers into the right spot, I wouldn't say automatically, but you can train the distances of a hand in a certain position. Um, so that's the other way. Then the second way is in between positions, which means shifting. And that is a lifelong journey. We always have to practice that. But um, oftentimes, I think intonation problems come not necessarily from the shifting, but from um, improper hand position that doesn't give the fingers the correct spacing. And then you have to literally work for every note instead of just the notes that are in between shifts. Sure, sure. Especially if your approach all along includes, as you mentioned, with the security spots, finding these spots with each of the fingers. So you've mm -hmm. kind of already controlled by substitution shifts for the hand position a little bit. So then the remaining focus is on now get those fingers spaced the right distance. All right. Outstanding. Now you are, as far as I know, the only person who has delved into the Hofmeister cello concertos. Can you talk a little bit about what led you to uncover those, discover those, and the the process of trying to create an edition, um, you know, a, a modern edition of music based on an old manuscript. Yes. Uh, I love that project. So I did my doctoral degree at Indiana University, and um, I started researching for topics very early, like after my first year of coursework already. And I had a topic that I liked uh, well enough. It has to had to do with music theory, so how to apply music theory to something that has um, existed. Um, and I basically um, had a topic ready to go. Um, and I kind of presented that to my um, professor, Emilio Colon. And he said, well, it's a nice topic. You will get your degree. I just... I thought you would do something better. So he he's amazing. He knows how to push me and he knew I could do better. Hmm. And he said, do your research, start researching, but please keep your mind open for something better to come along. Hmm. Okay, that's what I did. So I um, needed to do research in Vienna. Um, and went to Vienna and went in uh, to archives. And uh, there was, and there were multiple archives that were had an online registry. So we could research everything. But uh, there were archives where it was still this, like, like in the movies and the olden days where you pull out the card and you have to look through is it actually there or not. So, um, I went to an archive where that was the case, and um, the uh, archive director, Otto Bieber, gave me a very big book from Bärenreiter, who, who used to publish little booklets of what has been composed in a certain year in that area. And so I looked through it, and I'm already kind of like, it was the end of the day, and I'm just tired. And suddenly I see Hofmeister, Charlotte Concerto. And I think, huh, I didn't know he wrote one. And I felt really stupid for not knowing that. So I went home and went into my computer and looked. Couldn't find anything. Half my cello concerto doesn't exist. Contacted my professor. He's like, I have no idea. I don't think they exist. Good. I go back the next day and look in the archive and they had one. They had the D major cello concerto. And I felt, I, I cannot describe the feeling of having that manuscript in hand and kind of playing through it in my head and thinking, oh, this is actually a cool melody. Oh my God, this spot is so exciting. <laughs> and and so I couldn't have found it um, if I wouldn't have been in that archive and if, if I wouldn't have researched stuff that had nothing to do with my actual dissertation topic that I had in mind. 
So I threw everything away that I researched and did the new topic. And actually, not when you know what you're looking for, you find it. So I looked into other archives. I looked into rhythm, uh, like rhythm, the uh -huh. um, um, the the um, they just gather documents all over the world. And uh, I found of the same cello concerto in D major, two more manuscripts. And then I found two other cello concertos. One is in C major and one is in E flat major. Right. Um, and I decided that for purpose, it was best it's where I can compare. And making the addition, first of all, I had to learn how to um, use a software where I can put in the, like where I can, can engrave it digitally. And then I just did a lot of research on performance practice on the other cello concertos that were uh, other cello concertos and then other concertos written by um, Hofmeister and um, like the viola concerto and the double bass concerto. And they're also in D major and they have a very similar structure. So um, basically part of my dissertation was put in the notes then to find all the mistakes um, because there, there are mistakes um, in, in those manuscripts. Um, and I had to document all of the changes that I did because it's a, I called it a critical performance edition. So I made sure that people knew what I changed. Um, but then I also put in Boeings and stuff like that, that were definitely not part of the manuscripts. Um, but I made it clear that, um, like with, with the slurs that are like the, the broken slurs, mm -hmm. that these are all my suggestions. Um, and I just went to the viola concerto and the double bass concerto and other concertos written at the same time to look what has been done. Um, and there were passages, for example, where they were bars of just chords um, on top of on top of pizzicato in the um, in the orchestra. And I'm like, that's probably not what actually was wanted. So it's an improvisation on those chords, which was actually very common. And then I just researched what was common and did one of my own um, improvisations that I then wrote into the part, but it's clear in the score that that is from me and that anybody can do whatever they want if it's in the style. So, and uh, then I got the job. I actually finished my doctoral degree while I was already at the University of South Dakota. Um, and then I, I've i only been there for four and a half years. And uh, I, let's just say, I needed to focus on becoming a, a super, super professor. <laughs> and uh, I have, I have um, started with a C major concerto, but it's not published yet. And uh, yeah, so it, it has kind of been put on the back burner, unfortunately. But at some point, I will go, I'm going to go back into it. Yeah. You know, and there are, who knows how many cello concertos there are that are the manuscript of which is in some library somewhere that just is not currently available uh, yeah that, you know uh, so as time permits i hope you get more time to once once you do once you are able to finish these three see yeah. what else you can uncover yeah, that was kind of my my idea. And there's so much out there. I mean, the more I look, the if, if people need dissertation topics, just email me and I will send you stuff that I would do if I had time because there's so much out there. And I think that um, as the people that, for example, get performance degrees um, as their doctoral degree, why not do something performance related? And, and they're... And, there are grants that you can apply for for a research trip to Europe and you just go through archives. It's literally like being in a movie. Like I had those gloves on when I had, because, you know, like the skin has acid and I had the gloves on and I looked at it and I will never in my life forget the moment where I played through it in my head for the first time. I'm like, oh, this is pretty. And also for me, uh, the concert that I did with that concerto was not the thing that I was most excited about. I mean, I was excited about it, but for me, the thing that was the most exciting was the first rehearsal hmm. because this piece has probably not been performed in 200 years. 
nowadays we have Spotify, YouTube, whatnot. There's no surprise for us anymore when we go to concertos other than when we do contemporary music, mm-hmm. like a Beethoven sonata or whatnot. We all know it. We just go there for the interpretation. And those moments, the moments where we brought that piece back to life, mm-hmm. and and there are surprises, like a, a deceptive cadence, or there's like there are two parts where there's a dominant seventh chord that is followed by a general pause, and the whole orchestra was like, why is nobody playing? <laughs> like that, that moment of surprise, like I I will never forget. It was the best the best thing the best experience uh, for that for that whole year, and I will never forget it. That's great. That is a ringing endorsement. All right, now I will. I would also like to ask you. What's it like for the from the perspective, your perspective and that of what your cello students get out of it, uh, of having the uh, musical instrument museum there in Vermilion? I mean, I know it's been uh, closed for renovation for a while, but that is a one of a kind. I mean, there are some great musical instrument museums in the world, but that one has a number of things that are incredibly distinctive and the the wow factor is very high what's it like for you and your students having that uh, facility there on campus it's amazing it's like a five minute walking distance from the college of fine arts and it's just so incredible what they have there um, and they love to collaborate with us. So actually last week um, they had uh, an opening of a new gallery exhibit and they asked our students to perform in an opening. Nice. So when we went to the ribbon cutting and they performed there and then we got a sneak peek. It was the sneak peek the day before the opening. And I walked in there and I didn't exactly know what was in there. And I go and I look and in the corner, I see the King Amadi. And I literally, I jumped up and I was like, the King Amadi is back. It's back. So my students and I were like uh, politely rushing there. <laughs> and then, I mean, that instrument has such a history. And the fact that it's with us and we can look at it and we can see every little detail that has been on that instrument every little i mean it's incredible also all, all the cracks you can we can really see how old it is see how much this instrument has changed and how how like like just every detail you can go i mean it's behind glass but you can go so close and the nice thing is the um the staff there they we respect them and love them and it's that's the same for them when it comes to the music faculty. So if we ask, they set something up where we can actually see the instrument in person. Maybe not touch it, especially not with the bare hands. But um, I have I have seen, I have held the Amadi um, in the past. And my students, they haven't gotten that yet. But once it's reopened, I'm sure that there will be possibilities for them to see that. And we have amazing curators. They're more than happy to give tours for even two people um, and explain it so well and make it so interesting. And it's it's incredible. It's really I don't know what else to say. Um, and for the students, it's really nice because the National Music Museum, obviously, they have incredible instruments such as the King Amadi, and they have a whole uh, quartet of uh, Stradivari instruments. Um, but they also have instruments that are just, they have been donated at some point um, and they are not incredibly valuable, but they they obviously still keep them and they make them available to us. So I had a concert where I needed a Baroque cello and I don't own my own Baroque cello. So they loaned me a cello for that for that concert. Right. And they, they said, anytime you want to come and you want to try out some of the instruments um, that that are like not not the super valuable ones, just come. And um, they have viola da gamba. So my master's students right now, she really wants to play viola da gamba. And I played fiddle and viola da gamba since I was five until I was about 16. 
I can teach that as well. So we can go there and play and just the, the, the amount of resources we have just because that museum is in our town, it's incredible. It really yeah. is. I think the one that stood out to me the most the first time I went was the theremin cello. Yes. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Who thought of that? <laughs> yeah. Huh. yeah. And it's oh. supposed to, so the first floor is supposed to be um, opened in time for the fall semester. So Excellent. we have the small exhibits, um, and then uh, they they just keep reopening um parts of parts of the museum and it's going to be incredible for me it was my first concert um was uh, the last concert in the building so i i started at usd uh, fall 2018 and then um on i really remember that september 21st 2018 i had a concert in the national music museum and i was playing on the on the, on the strat that they had wow and nice and that, like that's literally how my job started. They were just like, <laughs> "Go and play that." Okay. And, <laughs> but, <laughs> that was not part of the job description, but I, I'm gladly taking that. <laughs> so uh, that's incredible. And um, they also, because of it, a small town like Vermilion gets a lot of people that are interested in coming, and then they always tell us. And usually the artists then give masterclass for our students or a, a little sneak peek concert in the concert that they would give at the National Music Museum. So it's just a wonderful collaboration between the music faculty, students, and the museum. Yeah. Terrific. Terrific. All right. Now, what do you have coming down the pike in 2023, I, including starting with this afternoon? <laughs> yeah, um, I... I have an exciting semester in front of me. Um, my, uh, we, we already started with my trio. Um, I'm part of the Rollins Piano Trio, which is um, just a faculty, the one of the piano faculty, the violin faculty, and me. Uh, we already have two concerts this semester. Today we are performing a recital at the University of North Dakota, which is why I'm so cold. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and... Um, then we give that same concert next week on our campus. I will then next weekend travel to Puerto Rico for the International Tambor Orchestra Puerto Rico Festival, where I perform in the orchestra. I uh, perform chamber music, um, and I'm now also the orchestra manager. So there's some organizational stuff that um, has to be done. Um, then literally the day when I come back, um, our guest artists from the University of uh, Reno, no, from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, uh, come, it's um, Amboise and Kate, they are the violin and viola faculty from that university, and I got to know Amboise actually in Puerto Rico, and they will give a recital with the trio, so we play the Brahms quintet together, and then we just, the trio goes to the University of Northern Iowa, then that faculty comes here. And then we do a whole trio tour in Michigan, Indiana, Iowa, uh, during the spring break, basically. And then I have another collaboration uh, with um, the cello professor from the University of Nebraska, Lincoln, Karen Becker. I will go there, play recital. She comes and we play a recital um, at my university. So it's just, it's very exciting. That's kind of the spring, and then the summer we have the summer music camp at the University of North Dakota, uh, South Dakota. Sorry, I'm now here. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> um, where I'm the assistant director um, currently, and I usually go to um, the festival FUSA. It's an orchestra festival at, in Fresno, um, where I'm also on the faculty. So that's that's kind of everything until not everything, but the big things. <laughs> I like. Sounds like a busy time. Isn't it nice to be back in full swing with performances? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that we all needed it. Um, <laughs> I, I think the arts, as much as they suffered, we got stronger in the sense of resilience because we didn't give up. We didn't just say, okay, we can't perform. And so we all give up. We found other alternatives to to performing, not maybe as rewarding because we need that interaction with the audience, but we didn't give up. And um, 
being back is just wonderful. I have to say that uh, I am very lucky with how the pandemic personally went for me just because I, my university was really looking out for the students and was looking out for us. And I think that the environment, despite the challenges, was still very positive. And so as much, I just, I saw all the suffering and I, it really pained me to see all of that. And I just tried to reach out as much as I could to other musicians, other people, and try to build connections through Zoom. And uh, I think I think this is actually one of the reasons why we have this, because I think I reached out to you during the pandemic and asked if we can collaborate. Um, and I did that with multiple faculty from different universities, and many of them thought it was a great idea because we were all so isolated. We were kind of doing our own studios and still teaching, still having a job, but it's not the same as no. collaborating. So I'm very grateful that you now reached out to still collaborate. <laughs> yeah, your your website has the Nietzsche quote about life without music is a mistake. Yeah. Yeah, I thought I remember that. All right. Yeah. Well, this is terrific. And thank you for your time. It's been a, a great pleasure talking with you. And I look forward to the next time we get to collaborate. Best of luck with all your performances and, and with the year in general. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me and talking to me and uh, listening to all of the stuff that I had to say, because I, yeah, as I said, I love collaborating. I love getting new ideas as well. So thank you so much for having me and talking to me. Entirely my pleasure. Well, thank you. All right. Well, everybody out there, you know the drill. Happy practicing all weekend and throughout the week. And we'll see you this time next Friday. Take care.